Good morning. So, KNES 310, your first lecture. I wish I could uh, just like force implant everything and just like uh, download it, preset, just but I can't. I'm from Delcom, very limited in my force powers. So what I will promise you though is that we're gonna take it reasonably slow, reasonably fast, uh, reasonable. I'm not gonna overload you, but at the same time, I gotta make sure I get everything you need uh, so that you can have this information going into biomechanics, okay? So before I get into teaching you how we move, I'm going to chat about why we move. Okay. And a lot of this is just taking a deep breath and just getting into, you know, some philosophical stuff, you know, just why do we move and you know and we move for different reasons right different people move for different reasons different circumstances will have you move for different reasons why does a child move you know because they're curious they're getting around they crawl in they they, they have this intrinsic uh desire to do what they see. They see us upright. They eventually want to be upright. And they're curious. They want to see what's in the other room. A child also moves to play. That's a, that's a job of a child, is to play, is to be active, and to do all these little social experiments, like banging pots and pans, you know, like my kids used to do. That's experiments. They're seeing what happens. They're doing acoustical experiments. So children move to be children, to do experiments, to see, oh, that's hot, or to see what happens when you knock something over the table. Like, that's life data. Sometimes we don't stop and think about it, but we, we are a product of all of those little experiments that we used to do as children. Children move. Adults move. Why do older people move? We'll go from the extreme. We started with children, old people. Usually older, retired people need to move to right, activities of daily living, right? Take care of themselves, clean themselves, bathe, put on their clothes, cook. Um, and as we know, sometimes that gets tougher and tougher to do as adults move through the life cycle, um, whether it be because of muscle atrophy, lack of range of motion, you lose range of motion when you get older, uh, osteoporosis, right? Uh, bones aren't what they used to be. And for, you can see this, you can kind of see that if you're watching a people watch and it, you could tell you know an older person just moves differently than maybe somebody who has normal ranges of motion maybe a younger person uh, you know you could you could look at someone from a distance you may not be able to see their face that they're older but you could just tell you could just tell and how they're moving right it just looks different and so for them, moving, why do they move? Is maybe not necessarily to put food on the table, but to put food on the table, to be able to cook, to be able to, right? And so what it boils down to is that we as humans move for a lot of different reasons. In sport, you know, if your job is to pitch, your movement strategy is going to be so for you to do that job. If you're a football player and your job is to catch 
a football. I mean, think about how it sounds very simple, right? Catch a ball, but you have a projectile coming at you. It's moving, it's falling, it's spinning. And your targeting computer, while you have on equipment, while you have on this third dimensional face mask that's kind of messing with your optics, you have to calculate where to put your hands in three dimensions so that the ball can eventually come and hit your hands. You're anticipating where the ball is going to be. You don't, the pros, they don't follow the ball. They literally have enough life data to know where the ball is going to be when it gets to this point and their hands are there to meet it. It's pretty impressive for such a simple task as catching a ball. But CrossFit athletes, why do they move? Ballerinas, why do they move? Fishermen, why do they move? I mean, it's like if you could get into the rabbit hole on a lot of different sport activities. And it all comes down to function or another term uh, for some of you that are going to be occupational therapist um, OT right occupational biomechanics is a term as well and it comes down to movement strategies that are optimal to your functional task so think about someone who's playing golf for the first time I mean, unless they're a natural, it's hard to get up to a golf ball on your first try and have a perfectly fluid golf swing and the ball goes exactly where you want it to go. It's ridiculously tough. Professionals who get paid to do this don't hit the fairway half the time because it's a tough task. It's a tough function. And it takes a long time to teach your body to do those movements. You know, when you had a uh, growing up, I, I use Etch-a-Sketch analogies a lot. And if you don't know what an Etch-a-Sketch is, you got to Google it. But it's a little toy we used to play with back in the day, and they had two knobs. So think about it, two knobs, right? A knob that goes up, down, and a knob that goes left, right. So it's two-dimensional, meaning that the little magnet can go up, down in one dimension and left, right in the other. They don't have a third knob for a third dimension. They don't have a knob that makes it go up, like literally up, down. Maybe I should have said if the Etch-a-Sketch is laying on the table, they have a forward back knob and a left, right knob. Okay? But my point is, is that with those two knobs, just those two knobs working together, that little magnet can go in infinitely many combinations. You know, you can, there's some people who do artwork. They can etch a sketch, the Mona Lisa. It's incredible. I, I can't draw a stick figure, but they can etch a sketch, the Mona Lisa. And so the point is, is, is two simple knobs, a front back knob and a left right knob. In combination, when you work them together, can create infinitely many placements of that little magnet. So think about all the knobs we have in our bodies. This is an analogy. I have finger knobs, fingers that can move, and knuckles that can move in different dimensions, and a thumb that can move in different dimensions. And then I have a wrist that can move in two different dimensions. And then I have an elbow that can move in two different dimensions. Then I have a radio ulna joint that can really get crazy and move. And then my shoulder, the most movable of them all, can can move in in, in in a lot of different ways. And then my scapula can my shoulder girdle can can move and my neck can move and my right down the line. So now if the two simple knobs on an etch a sketch can create the Mona Lisa, amplify that to all the different knobs we have in our bodies that have even more than just two different options. So the point is, 
is when we combine all of these different knobs, ankle, knee, hip, trunk, shoulder, elbow, wrist, it, it really creates an exponential uh, movement options. You know, there's just so many things that, can, that we can do. Now, sometimes I think about uh, silly things, but like if you've ever seen a, uh, a dance recital or, or, or dancing coordination, in my mind, I'm like, how have they not run out of ideas yet? You know, the elbow can only do so much and it can only do so many things. But yet every choreographed dance I've ever seen is somewhat different. I mean, there may be similar moves, but it's different. Why? Because the possibilities of movement, not at the individual knobs, the possibility of movement on the Etch-A-Sketch knob is not infinite. And this knob is not infinite, but together, that's the key. When you combine them, you get infinitely many different kind of squiggles. And that's what we're talking about here. The motion at my wrist is very limited, but the motion of my wrist combined with other things is infinite. That's really cool. So before we get into how we move, we have to remember why we move. And what do we move in? Like that's something we don't think about as often as well. What do we move in? <sighs> Man, what does that mean, Campbell? Well, imagine a fish, right? A fish has a little fish brain. We have little fish brains too, but, but over time we've expanded on that. Now we have big, cool human brains. But we have, uh, you know, very lizard-like parts of our little brain, fight, flight, that kind of stuff. But my point is, a fish lives in something. It, it lives in a medium. It lives on a stage, this, this water-filled stage. But do you think the fish realizes it lives in water? That's all it's ever known. There's no idea. There's this bulk of, 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 of uh, scaffolding that it can swim around, and it can swim up and down and left and right. It has no perception of its environment. In other words, the only reason the fish can go up and down is because it lives in the water. The water is the stage of which the fish, if the fish was taken out of the water, it could flop around, but it couldn't go up or down unless it had its medium, unless it had its scaffolding. The world is a stage. So you think about that in literal terms, where if you were on a stage and you were performing, you were moving, that stage provides you with the bulk. It provides you with the scaffolding to move up, back, left, right, up, down. And when I say up, down, you can literally jump up and down on the stage or you can have something picking you up and down, right? The stage provides the three dimensions of possible movement of you. And when I say you, your, your, your mass, your stuff, you, okay? So three dimensions, that's something we've heard before. You go to a movie that's in 3D and you think about in layman's terms, what does 3D mean? Well, I'm watching the screen and I can perceive things happening up, down. You like my spirit finger? Up, down, that's my magic fingers. It's magic left, right, and then the third dimension, you put on the 3D goggles or the glasses, and all of a sudden things are coming out at you. Now, we have a, you don't need 3D to be able to in, infer the third dimension, meaning that if you're just watching a regular movie, your eyes can kind of tell what's in the background, what's in the foreground, but literally 3D. 3D goggles, something looks like it's coming out at the movie screen at you, right? It's a wizard. So three dimensions. We use it a lot, but let's remind ourselves what it is. Three dimensions is a straight line concept. In mechanics, and that's what I am, I'm a biomechanist. 
And a biomechanist is someone who applies basic laws of physics to biological systems. In this case, the human is my biological system, but there's people who could apply biomechanics to dogs, cats, butterflies, any living biological system. You can look at the physics and how they move. Well, anyway, movement to a biomechanist can mean two different things. You have straight line motion up, down, left, right, front, back. The water bottle can move in straight lines. And each dimension is like a knob on the Etch-a-Sketch. One knob, but twisting that knob can make the bottle move two different ways in that same knob dimension. So if an Etch-a-Sketch knob represents a dimension, one dimension, one knob, notice how if I spin the knob one way, it makes the magnet go forward. And if I spin the knob the other way, it makes the magnet go back. One knob, one dimension, two different directions of motion. You apply this all the time. When you're on a road, it's one road, but have two different directions of motion. You could be traveling east or west on Interstate 10. You could be traveling north or south on Interstate 49. The road is one dimension. Interstate 10 is one road. It represents one dimension of movement. How you travel on that road is your direction of motion. Okay? So, three dimensions. One dimension. Two dimensions. And then my third knob three dimensions. Now, where this gets could be confusing is just like with the Etch-a-Sketch, when I move each knob independently, life is super easy. I wonder what happens when I twist this knob. Oh, it makes the magnet do this. What happens when I twist this knob? Oh, it makes the magnet do that. What happens with, oh, okay. When, when things are extracted stripped down to their basics, life is great. The problem is when you move all three knobs at the same time, you get some crazy movement possibilities. As we've discussed, infinite. There's infinitely many ways you can move all the knobs at the same time. Heck, that was infinitely many ways we could move two knobs at the same time. Imagine that third dimensional knob. So what my job is to teach you guys is how to take human movement that is going to be in three dimensions, three knobs moving at the same time, chaos, and teach you how to extract, how to break down something that's super complex looking and say, whoa, that complex movement is really made of three simple dimensions of knobs. I wonder what, how it's moving in this dimension. I'm going to teach you how to do that, to just look at this dimension. Oh, okay, it's going forward. Oh, hey, it's going back. Or, hey, it went forward, then it came back. And then I'll teach you how to look at it from another dimension. And then, so the point is, is that s together, all combined, you may have a task like throwing a baseball. But to a biomechanist, we need to break that down. To someone who's trained in human motion, like in anatomical kinesis, we need to be able to break that down and say, oh, this is what's happening in this dimension. This is what's happening in that dimension. And this is what's happening in the other dimension. Why is that important? Because human movement take place in dimensions. 
not straight line dimensions, but rotational dimensions. And I'm going to get into that on Wednesday's lecture. But it's the same concept that we extract and we break down things based on their dimensions to make it a lot easier for us to analyze position and motion. Okay, So our bulk, where do we live? The fish lives in the water. We live in this invisible scaffolding of three dimensions. The room that I'm in, I'm in the Carlson room, and there's three dimensions in here for me to move around, to me to play. The first dimension is, you know, you, and there's so many ways you can look at this, length times width times height, cubed, it's three dimensions. The room has length. I know that because I'm looking at the back wall and this is the front wall. Why do I know it's the front wall? That's where the chalkboard's at. Everybody look to the front. It has length. It has width. The side walls. It has depth. The ceiling and the floor. So just the, uh, uh, the encasing of this room shows me the bulk. It shows me the, the theater. It shows me the, 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 the dimensions that I have to play in, the potential I have to move. If, if the side walls came in, I, I couldn't move here. I could only move up, I could only move like this. But because the side walls expanded into a new dimension, now I can move infinitely many combinations. Okay, so why do we move? We talked about that earlier. There's a lot of different reasons to need to move. How do we move? We're going to get into that. But remember, how we move is because we have the ability to move. We have a stage in order to move. You give a fish more water, the fish is going to swim more and the fish is going to get bigger because it has more room to grow. That's our dimensions. We have to have room to grow, okay? So, uh, some of the things you guys are going to need to, um, giving you some homework is, review your bones from anatomical, uh, not anatomical, biology, uh, la, uh, uh, anatomy and physiology. Review the bones because I'm just going to talk about them like you know them. So for instance, when I'm going into the elbow joint eventually, it's going to take a while, but when I get into the elbow joint, you're going to need to know what the radius is. You're going to need to know the ulna. You're going to know the humerus. So I'm just going to talk about them like you know them because this is a junior level kines class you got to know these things and remember in in lab where they would give you a bone and you had to say hey is this a left or a right how'd you figure that out because you were taught to look for clues you look for clues and you were like okay well the thumb in anatomical position is lateral more on the outside and and uh, let me look for more clues oh this is a lecronon that's in the back Right, that's a posterior landmark, and, and the radius is lateral, and the radius rotates about the... The point is, is you were taught how to look for clues. It's no different in human motion. We look for clues. I'm going to teach you how to look for clues before and after pictures or before and after perceptions. We look for clues in human movement. Okay? So it's no different. So per, learn or review your bones. Make sure you know the major bones, movable bones. I mean, I'm not talking like Incus, Malleus, Stapes, and, and, uh, the, you know, those little guys. Not that that's not important maybe for something you want to do. But for us, we're talking about our major bones that articulate our joints uh, that are going to be important. Okay. We rotate joints. I'm going to differentiate between the three dimensions of straight line and the three dimensions of rotational. That's Wednesday's lecture. 
but I do want to plant seeds today that I'm going to hopefully harvest down the road. And that is we translate things. Like if I'm throwing a boxing jab, I'm translating my fist. Some of my forearm is translating forward. Some of my humerus is translating forward. Some of my scapula is translating forward. Heck, if I step into it, maybe some of my center of mass is translating forward. But the cool thing is that I have my straight line knob box here with our three dimensions of straight line. And then I have this rotational knob box, a different box for rotational movements. Okay. In order for us to translate ourselves, whether that's our hands, our arms, our center of mass, our legs, in order for us to be responsible for straight line moving anything, we have to rotate. We have to spin something. Something's got to spin. And if that concept is kind of off right now, it's just we don't really think about it that much. But let's really give it some silly thought. How could I move myself without rotating something? Meaning, if I'm standing here or sitting here and I wanted to make myself rise up, I would have to have one Jedi mind trick powers. I'd have to be a Jedi because watch, I'm like, how, how can I make myself rise up if I don't rotate anything in terms of my body joints, right? I, I got to rotate something. In other words, if I stand up, my hips are going to extend. My knees are going to extend. Maybe I have some ankle motion, right? So making my body elevate up, translate up was because I had some spinny things happening in my legs. If I make my arm go up, it's because I had spinny things happening at my shoulder and spinny things happening at my elbow. And if you didn't see the spinny thing happening at my elbow, let me not move my elbow and my shoulder at the same time and show you what it's like. Spinny thing happening at my elbow. It's just an illusion because it's happening at the same time at my shoulder. So you don't get the this part. Okay. Spinny things, spinny things, making segments go up and down. Okay. So a key phrase I would like for you guys to uh, remember going into Wednesday's lecture is we rotate to translate. And I think that is a great phrase because it ties in the three different uh, types of movement, straight line motion and rotational motion. Uh, I'll give you, I love analogies. And so I'm going to give you a quick analogy with the kids playing on a playground, a, a different analogy. Straight line motion would be like a kid going down a slide where they're going down the slide and their motion is going at a combination of down because as they go down the slide, they get further and further down and the slide is at an angle. So they're going down and they're going across. Whee! It's an example of a straight line activity. Now, again, we rotate to translate. How did the kid get up the slide? Well, they had to rotate lower extremity things, but once they're on the slide, gravity can translate them down and across. An example of a pure rotational activity is like a merry-go-round. If a kid is on a merry-go-round and the merry-go-round is rotating them, spinning them, notice that the merry-go-round itself never goes up, down, left, right, front, back. The center of mass, the center of stuff on a merry-go-round stays in the same place because its motion is purely rotational. Okay? So we rotate in order to translate. That doesn't mean something else can't translate us. Like if I'm on an elevator, the elevator is making me go up. The elevator is letting me go down. But if 
I'm responsible for my movement. I have to rotate things. When I walk, I rotate things, okay? Moving my center of mass, making me translate across the hall because I'm rotating things, okay? So that is of importance. We rotate to translate. Wednesday's lecture, we are going to get into uh, the Ten Commandments. I'm going to post that on Moodle uh, for you guys uh, to prep. It's uh, the Ten Commandments. It, 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 it's, it's a play off of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. But they are basically rules that can help prevent uh, careless mistakes on a test. Rules to live by in anatomical kinesiology. Like, uh, for example, like we don't assume. We never assume because our eyes play tricks on us. We can't trust our eyes sometimes. So we just have to double check. You know, Hey, eyes, I, I know you think you saw what you saw, but let's just make sure. Like I said, you were taught to look for clues. You didn't just get a bone and assume that it was a right. You said, well, it looks like a right, but let me make sure. Let me look for those prominences in the front. Oh, there's the bicipital groove. That's anterior. So if this is anterior, no, that's not going to articulate in the front. It, the, on the right side, it must be a left. So that's an example. We don't assume. Uh, we analyze motion joint by joint, which is basically saying we do it knob by knob. We don't assume because, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of different ways I can make my fingers move on the stage of our three dimensions. I can make my fingers move like this. I can make my fingers move like this. I can make my fingers move without even moving my fingers. I can make my fingers move because of this. I can make my fingers move because of this. I can move my wrist and then make my fingers. So that's a good example. Maybe this is a better example. If my shoulder's out, if you see arm go up, your instinct may be, oh, that's abduction of the shoulder. <sighs> but what if my arm goes up and I didn't have abduction of my shoulder? In other words, this angle, there was no change in angle at the shoulder joint, but yet you saw my arm go up. So that's an example of don't assume. It might appear, ring the bell and you salivate, right? My job is to teach you not to salivate. When that bell rings and you want to regurgitate something, take a step back and say, wait, I know what I, my instinct wants me to say, but let me just fact check me. Let me just double check to make sure that I'm seeing what I think I'm seeing. It's an illusion. There's a lot of illusions to human movement. And that's my job. My job is to teach you about illusions within the human body. So there's four main types of, of, of movement interpretations. Two of them are super easy. It looks like it's not moving and it's not. It looks like it's moving, and it is. It looks like it's moving, but it's not. And it looks like it's not moving, but it is. I'll give you an example of all four with my neck, with motion of my neck. It looks like it's moving, and it is. It looks like it's not moving. And it's not. It looks like it's not moving, but it is. I had neck motion there. And then the last one, it looks like it's moving, but it's not. So we could apply that concept to every joint in the body. It looks like it's moving, and it is. 
that's pretty easy. That might you might have gotten those in like a 100, 200 level kines classes where you're learning the basic joint motions and it's always it looks like it's moving and it is and you're like I got this human motion stuff down. It's good. Life ain't like that. <laughs> life like life is like a box of chocolates, guys. There's going to be times where it looks like it's moving and it is, but there's going to be a lot of times where it looks like it's moving, but it's not. Or it looks like it's not moving, and it is. That happens a lot. So that's really where my job is, is to go into each joint, teach you really what's happening between those articulations of those bones, and then pressure cook these illusions where I need you to be able to see that it looks like it's not moving, but it is because this is what's happening. Or it looks like it's moving, but it's not. There's all kinds of cool examples that we're going to get to eventually on this journey of anatomical kinesiology. Okay, So let's review. I taught you that things rotate to translate. Check out my son's little rolly thingy here. Right? We rotate to translate. The wheels are spinning so that the center of mass of this super duper spiky car vroom vroomer that he never plays with, that's why I had it, we rotate to translate, okay? We rotate to translate. And the only difference between the wheels of a car and our ankles and feet is that we can't continue to spin, right? So we we spin, we 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 roll our tire, and then we pick it up and reposition it to roll again, roll again. And while this tire finished rolling, we pick it up to reposition it, and then the other side rolls, roll, roll, rolls like a cat. Okay, so. There's a lot of similarities with how we move and how cars move because we both rotate to translate. Okay, so that's important. Another thing you guys need to do on your own is go over your bones, major bones of the body, especially the ones at the ankle joint, subtalar joint, knee, hip, our vertebra, our lumbar, our thoracic, our cervical scapula, shoulder girdle, clavicle, right, sternum, uh, scapula, uh, go over maybe major bony landmarks like the acromion, spine of the scapula, uh, uh, gl the glenoid fossa, like those kind of major things, that's going to help you. That is going to help you, okay? So, what I'm going to do, my homework, is to post all of the information that you guys are going to need on Moodle. So that way you can uh, download that, you can print it out, whatever style works for you. And uh, I want everyone to do super well this semester. Uh, hit me up if you have any questions. Uh, but you guys have a great Monday, and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday.